present their latest production, Radio Days 2. Not the
No, 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 we do nothing of the kind. I drive it. When I say you drive, I don't mean you drive. I mean that I drive, although it's a you drive. I see. When you say you drive, you don't mean we drive. Now you got it. You mean you drive because I don't drive. Now I got it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now look at it. You go to a place and you're going to rent a car. Yes. You are driving a car. Yes. Where am I sitting? You're sitting right next to me. Is there a steering wheel in front of me? No. And you are positive that I am not driving? I am positive. And you are driving the car? Yes. What, right, what kind of a car are you driving? Uh, you drive. You <laughs> drive. Somebody better be driving. No, 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 look, please. I can't explain this. We go and rent a car. Right. Now, where are we going to get it? A you drive company. Now I drive company? I thought we were going to be alone. You don't understand. It hurts. You drive. Well, if it hurts, you drive. That's right. This is getting kind of worse, isn't it, ain't it? Don't you see? Don't you see? The, the, the head of the company hurts. That's too bad. What hurts you? Nothing hurts him. Look, every company has to have a head. Naturally. Now, this company's head hurts. Oh, why doesn't he take an aspirin? Listen, hurts you drive all over the country. Well, if it hurts you to drive all over the country, why should I drive and get hurt? You don't get hurt. I'm not going to get hurt. You don't get hurt, Castell. Nobody's going to hurt me. That's right. You're not going to get hurt. I'm not a fool to get hurt. Look, you're not going to get hurt. It's Hertz Company. Oh, the Hertz Company. I still, I, I still don't look at it. I, I am all mixed up. All right. It's very simple. I don't want to hurt nobody. Look, take it easy. The man's name is Hertz. It's Vince, it's Vince Cars. You drive. It's you drive all over the country. You drive all over the country? No, we can't do that. What are you talking about? We got a lousy gas ration sticker. An A sticker. Oh, call me a taxi. Okay, you're a taxi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the Pepsi Cola Hour. First, here's a word from our sponsor. Tonight, for your pleasure, here is Rena Sherman with her rendition of Cole Porter's Night and Day. Rena has been delighting audiences with her music for many years, and we're lucky to have her here with us tonight. Take it away, Rena. Many, 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 many years. <laughs>
Uh, that, I was singing along to a tape that was made about 12 years ago with my husband accompanying me. So I wasn't always exactly in time, but when Ernie told me he had that recording of Sam playing with me, I just couldn't resist the nostalgic feeling and the joy it would give me to sing a song along with my husband as a compliment. This one is... Lena, you did a wonderful performance, and I know that the audience would love to hear you sing another song. Okay.
And now direct from Radio City, the Toe Tappers. This group was inspired and created by Jackie Levitt, who has been working with these young ladies since 1925. <laughs> we are just back from a worldwide tour of countries that we don't happen to be at war with. Silly song. Oh, 
Inhale. What? Inhale. I would like to see you. I would like to see you. <laughs> the whole problem with you is you need glasses. Eyeglasses? I suppose if I had a headache, I'd need an umbrella? My fee is $10. For what? For my advice. $10 for your advice? That's right. Well, doctor, here is $2. Take it. That's my advice. <laughs> that was a wonderful that was wonderful thank you so much oops my producer just signaled that I have to stretch this little intermission so I'll have to tell you a story I just heard a paramedic received a 9-11 call from a lady who said she was about to give birth. And the only one with her was her three-year-old daughter. To add to her problem, her electricity was off. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> For some reason, the paramedic got there just in time to deliver the baby. He asked the three-year-old to hold a flashlight since there was no light in the house. In a matter of minutes, a baby boy arrived, and the paramedic slapped him so that he would cry. When everybody was settled, he asked the little girl what she thought she had just witnessed. She immediately said, it serves him right for crawling up there in the first place. Smack him again. Yeah. 
You got a clap in there. I hope you locked the back door. The cat got out three times last week. The cat won't get out tonight. Why, where did you put him? In the birdcage. In the birdcage? Where's the canary? In the cat. Uh, John Dickerson. Please, stop knocking yourself out. Nothing happened to the canary. And the cat's fast asleep in the oven. Well, don't scare me like that. Are you sure all the animals are taken care of? I am sure. How about the fish bowl? Did you heat up the water for the new baby goldfish? I heated the water, gave the paddle, burnt them twice, and changed his diaper. Would you just put out the lights and let me sleep? Why are you so cross and disagreeable all the time, John? Because I'm exhausted. That's not true. You'd rather stay out all night carousing with your roughneck friends. It just kills you to spend one night with me. Oh, it doesn't kill me. The funny thing, I don't need anybody else. I'm always satisfied just to be with you. Well, you're in better company than I am. <laughs> Good night, Blanche. No love, no affection. How I envy Louise Shaw. Her husband treats her more like a friend than a wife. Settle down, Blanche. <laughs> no, I won't. You think Louise ever makes breakfast for Mel? Not that lazy lump. She makes him go to work every day without a morsel of food, just a kiss for breakfast. <coughs> Would you be satisfied with that? Sure. Send her over in the morning. <laughs> I mean, would you be satisfied if I gave you a kiss for breakfast? Blanche, I'd be satisfied with anything if you just let me get some sleep. Answer me. Do you want a kiss for breakfast? Yes. Well, then ask for it. Blanche, I want a kiss for breakfast. Don't do me any favors. I'll <coughs> never let you kiss me again as long as you live, not until you apologize. Apologize for what? What did I do? It's not what you've done. It's what you haven't done. You haven't told me you loved me for years. Why don't you say you're sorry you married me? Because I'm not. Am I the only wife in the world for you? You're the only wife in the world for me. You're lying. <coughs> swear. I swear I'm lying. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I mean I'm not lying. That's no way to sneer. No, swear. <laughs> Say it nicely. You're the only wife in the world for me. Really, John? Really. I wouldn't have another wife in the world like you. <laughs> Tell me you love me, John. Really. I, uh, I love you. How much do you love me? How much do you need? Well, Rosh Hashanah is two days away, and I haven't got a new hat. What happened to the hat you had last year? It's in the box on the dresser, but that hat's all worn out. Why don't you wear the box? Oh. You can't be squandering my money on hats every year. Please, John, just this once, I saw a wonderful hat with a reversible brim that can be turned up or down. How much is it? Sixty dollars. Turn it down. Turn it down, turn it down. I turn everything down because you're always looking for bargains. When you married me, you didn't get any bargains. How well I know it. Oh, you know what I mean. It's only sixty dollars. Blanche, 
How can you squander my money like that? I deny myself everything. I wish my poor granddaddy was alive. He'd never let you treat me like this. All of a sudden, she's got a granddaddy. <laughs> I never heard you mention him before. He was the best friend I ever had. I took his advice on everything. He could have settled a lot of our problems. I bet he'd tell you, let me keep that hat. How do you know? Because I know. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. Suppose he isn't in heaven. What then? What then? Then you can ask him. <laughs> Good night, Frank. Good night, John. Major Edward Bowe was the original amateur hour. Our honor city this week is Bridgeport, Connecticut. Vote by a letter or postcard addressed to Jake and Sam Bourne in care of your own state. And please remember this. There is nothing more refreshing these hot days than Jake and Sam Bourne coffee, ice. Try it. It's a superb blend of the world's choice coffee and is very economical in price. We now present Major Edward Bowles and his original amateur drama. Welcome. Welcome to the Major Bowles Amateur Hour, American Radio's best known talent show. We've been on the air since September 1934. More recently, we've been called the Chase and Sandler Hour. Our we, our contestants love support. They, they're at, but they're at your mercy. We like a lot of applause. But if you want to give them a loud cat call, we respect your opinion. Our first contestant is a five-year-old Jackie Temple. Jackie wants to tell us about her favorite goodness. <laughs> Great, little Jackie. 
I hope that Hollywood is listening. I can see you as a star in our newest venue, the movies. Good luck. Now our next performer is Very good. Phil Durante. Phil's going to tell us about his career and also about Inca Dinka Doo. Welcome, Phil Durante. That's the music. Oh, what a time for Rudy 
The doctor will be here in an hour. Suppose you, uh, you don't understand how important this is. Yeah, well, I don't. Well, I, it's not for myself I'm doing it for. It's for you and the family. Insurance is protection. If anything happens to me, you'll get a lot of money. How much? Oh, maybe $10,000. Daddy. What? Can I have a dime in advance? No, you already had your allowance this week. But I'll get the dime back to you. When? When I get the $10,000. Snooks, I don't think you know what you're saying. You only collect insurance if something happens to the insured. Well, what can happen? Why, hundreds of things. And there's a different type of policy to cover each one of them. Mm -hmm. Life insurance, health, accidents. Why, you could even insure a finger. My little finger, Daddy? Which one? Why, yes. Suppose you lost a finger. <laughs> How could I lose it? It's stuck to me. I didn't mean you leave it lying around somewhere, but, but suppose you accidentally cut off your finger. What would happen? <laughs> I could only count to nine. <laughs> no. You could collect on it. Let's say it, it's my finger. Yeah. If it should happen to get cut off, the company would pay a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars? For your little finger? Yes, sir. <coughs> I caught my throat, I think of this. Let's cut it off. Snooks, <laughs> please. Go away and let me sleep. My blood pressure is bad enough. Can't the doctor fix it, Dad? No, this doctor isn't coming to fix things. He's coming here to look me over. Whatever he finds, finds wrong, he will report to his company. I don't like that doctor, Daddy. Why not? Because he's a snitch. He's not a snitch. He is too. He is a dirty old, mean old snitch. Oh, Snooks. For the love of heaven, leave me alone. Go away. Yeah, where? Anywhere. Oh, go on, go outside. No, no, you don't. No, I'll go someplace else in the house. I'm trying to take a bath. Well, I'd like to take a nap, too. Well, now that's a good idea. Yeah. Suppose you run up to your bedroom and lie down. No, I want to lie next to you on the couch. You can't. I want to lie next to you on the couch. All right, all right. I suppose it's the only way I can get some rest. Well, come on, lie here next to Daddy and go to sleep. All right. Good night, little Daddy. Good night. Daddy. Yes? I think I got a Saint-Pierre and I'll say Well, a... just lie there quietly and don't disturb me. All right. Daddy. What is it? Oh, well, what's a Saint-Pierre? <laughs> Listen, Stokes, if you can't fall asleep, count sheep. Little woolly sheep? Yes. With those big brown eyes? Yes. I don't like sheep! Well, can can count kangaroos jumping over the fence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I like kangaroos. Oh, oh, good. Well, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22. All right, let's have it. What happened to 14 and 19? Oh, they tripped. Ah, that settles it, Snooks. If I hear one more peep out of you, I'm going to take my belt off, and you know what happens then. Yeah, your pants will fall down. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you a tanning, that's it. Now, either you let me take a nap, or you suffer the consequences. But, Daddy! No, no, so. But, Daddy, I just... Now, you heard me. Oh! Now, don't open your mouth. 
I can get more rest in a boiler factory. So you just close your eyes for 15 minutes. Oh, there's the doctor. Oh, there our boyfriend. Yeah, me too. Well, we'll leave Snooks and Daddy till next week when we find out what Snooks comes up with to annoy her father then. This program was brought to you by Jello. J-E-L-L-O. Remember, there's always room for Jello. Here now is Fiorello Laguardia. He was mayor of the New York City during the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II. He is adored by many New Yorkers who have taken to calling him the little flower. Let's keep going on and on. The little flower because he is so short and always wears a carnation in his lapel. He is a colorful character. He rides the New York City fire trucks. Raid city speakeasies with the police department. Takes entire orphanages to baseball games. And when the New York newspapers went on strike, he got on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids. Here is Mayor LaGuardia himself. One bitterly cold night in January of 1935, I went to a night court that served the poorest ward of the city. I dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench myself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before me, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told me her daughter, husband, had deserted her. Her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. But the storekeeper from where she stole the bread would not drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor. She's got to be punished to teach the other people around here a lesson. I turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. As I pronounced the sentence, I was already reading, reaching into my pocket. I extracted a bill, tossed it into my famous hat, and said, here is the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this room 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Baylor, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to the bewildered woman who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. 50 cents of that amount was contributed by the grocery store owner himself, while some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York City policemen, each of whom had just paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave me a standing ovation. Someone beautifully said, Sympathy sees and says, I'm sorry. 
Compassion says, I'll help. When we learn the difference, we can make a difference. What a man that LaGuardia is. He was there when we needed him. Just a minute. Just a minute. We interrupt this broadcast for an important message from our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, speaking from the White House. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces from the Empire of Japan. It will be recorded that the distance from, Hull, from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by the false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between Honolulu and San Francisco. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us God.
at this time, please join us in singing Irving Berlin's God Bless America. Yeah. 